Yeah, American Issues Take Two. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. We're going to talk about Trump. We don't like talking about Trump. We think maybe it's a good idea not to talk about Trump. But we're going to talk about Trump and mm, why we shouldn't listen to him. Uh, okay, so uh, this is called uh, What Future for Trump Now? Uh, and we have uh, my co-host, uh, Tim Apicella. We have our special esteemed guest, Ricky Caetano. And we have Stephanie Stoll Dalton, who is a regular contributor here on <clears throat> American Issues Take Two. Welcome to all of you to the show. Uh, Tim, we're going to talk about Trump today. I really don't like talking about Trump. We've all agreed that it's probably better for the world if we don't say even repeat his name. Um, but, you know, he's raw meat for the press. Everybody wants to talk about him and people want to hear about him. And there's nobody else they'd rather hear. But let me let me ask you, if there was somebody else out there, another entertainment person, another person, who, you know, who likes, um, you know, uh, uh, the kind of show that The Apprentice was, who likes raw meat on television, who likes to follow it day to day and see the machinations and all that. Uh, wouldn't that help? Uh, right now, he's the only show in town in terms of the fellow who presents, you know, this kind of exciting entertainment every day, who, who wants, needs, and has methods to appear in the headline every bloody day. Well, two points, uh, by the way, good morning, Jay. Uh, two points on that is, remember, Donald Trump's announcement for the 2024 presidency is the earliest in history a candidate has ever put forth. Um, we could talk about why he did that. I think it was try to uh, flummox the pending indictments coming against him. But uh, so it's way early in the game. So why would another candidate repeat such a, a, a silly mistake? They wouldn't. They're going to wait. They're going to probably wait until March of 2023 or April or whatever. But um, so Donald Trump is way ahead of the game. And I think it's going to work horribly against him because um, Donald Trump in 2016, we talked about this before the show, was the, uh, the sideshow of the circus. And people were, had never seen that before, quite like Donald Trump uh, put it out there. And uh, they, were, they were, you know, enthralled and the media was enthralled. And that's what we got. And Donald Trump was reelected as a result of all that media attention. But now, 2024, we've seen this show. Uh, we paid the price of entry, and I think a lot of Americans are done with it. They're burned out, Trump fatigue, whatever you want to call it. Um, so the sideshow is no longer alluring. So do we need another uh, sideshow to compete with Donald Trump? Maybe not. Probably not. Uh, Carrie Lake comes to mind. She's a great sideshow, but she's not. Been, she has not been elected. She's been thrown out. She's done. So to answer your question, uh, we don't need a, a competitor. Uh, co excuse me, a competitor when it comes to a sideshow. Hmm. Um, Vicky, you know, it, it may be that we just have to wait a little and see Trump um, do some self-destruction here in the next few months. Um, and maybe that will be, you know, the opportunity for somebody else to pop up, to emerge and, and be a competitive entertainment feature. Um, do you have any thoughts on when that might happen and who it might be? You know, Tim, I hear what you're saying and Jay, but I wouldn't put it past him. You know, I think uh, he sees that his base is starting to crumble and I think he's starting early to rebuild that. And while Carrie Lake may be out, you still have Marjorie Taylor Greene. OK, and she's very much another one of those entertainment sideshows. The sad thing, I think, is that many of the American public today don't either have the uh, interest or desire to learn more and talk about the issues. They're distracted with these larger than life for better or worse personalities that suck up all the energy, almost cult like cult-like, really, follow to, the, to their death kind of a thing. And I wouldn't put it past him to find a way to uh, resurrect himself into another persona, perhaps a victim now. Um, I mean, he just it never fails to shock or, you know, to shock me and how he can find a way to still gain not maybe, a you know, the majority, but still a good number of our population and voters. And that's what's scary. Yeah, what's scary is it's not just one thing. It's not just the entertainment aspect. It's other, th other things, too. I got an article uh, from Rolling Stone here, is it? And uh, very interesting um, that they are saying, not, not dissimilar from what we're saying, is that he is um, intimidating people or trying. And that was part of his playbook before. 
Uh, once he achieved a certain level of power, then he would intimidate everybody around him and demand their loyalty and threaten them. And the, I'll just read the first paragraph of this Rolling Stone political ar article. <clears throat> in, the day, in the days running up to the election, Trump made a series of phone calls to GOP lawmakers and other elected officials demanding that they endorse him before he announced that he's running. You love it? Uh, or at least right after he announces that, according to two sources with knowledge of the conversation. The president said he was, I don't call him the president, Trump said he was tracking who endorsed him early, adding that those who waited too long, in quotes, were, quote, not going to like what happens when he wins. Um, Trump, who lost the 2020 election, had long operated on the assumption that he'll win back the White House. He, he also said he was keeping tabs on who jumped ship for Florida Governor Ron DeSantis or other potential um, 2024 political challenges, the sources say. There's much more to it. It's very interesting. But, but I, I raise it, Stephanie, because I want to run it by you in terms of in another weapon in Trump's you know, playbook, and that is intimidating people. Um, apparently, he started doing that even before the election, the midterm election. And undoubtedly, he's doing it now. Is it is it effective? Is it going to be effective? Could it be effective later? Um, I certainly agree. And you're pointing out a critical issue about him, but it as as important and integral to his path is his indefatigability. He never stops. Okay, and he um, is in his own fantasy world. Uh, believing all of these things, that's not going to change, even in the face of familial disregard for his his new campaign. I, yeah, that was interesting that Ivanka is not participating and sort of looks like her husband's sort of half in, half out. But nevertheless, he will not stop. And this is reminding me of all I'm hearing today on NPR about Netanyahu in Israel. It's exactly very similar. It's uh, similar. Uh, I don't know if it's exact or not, but the point is that Netanyahu has been indefatigable though too and stayed on it and stayed on it to the point where now Israel has the most conservative right wing uh, government they have ever had, meaning like the two state uh, uh, plan is is not going to be useful anymore. Anyway, so it's a very, very difficult, a difficult situation for them. And now we have him doing the same thing here. And recall that um, the the election was narrow margin. OK, I sat there watching that we're down to these itty bitty increments of point ten. It just, just just made no sense to me. So that did not inspire me that we're over the hump here. We are not over the hump. There's a power base out there, powerful base out there that's taking note of that. And as you're saying, he can electrify it, energize it and intimidate it and work it to his his best degree jay and i don't know what's standing in the way of him doing that now it, it he may get indicted something i don't know that there's anything that can get in the way of that so that we are fully fully vulnerable still and we cannot stop for a minute to assume that he's in the box because he's not they're all still out there waiting for him tim i want to go to something we've talked about for months really uh, something that Stephanie just raised, and that is the um, the, the the effect of indictments. You know, I, I'm not encouraged by the delay over the past two years, uh, where the Department of Justice hasn't really found a way to indict him on anything. Zero. Um, yeah, we have a bunch of cases going on, but uh, we don't have an indictment. We don't have a result. And so I'm wondering, you know, a what effect has that had on his ability to uh, operate out of his playbook, and B, how will that affect his playbook if he is indicted? And and uh, number three or C, <laughs> is, is what do you think? Is he going to be indicted or not? Well, on the last show, I said, expect one in 30 days. We're now probably about day 23. I'm mm -hmm. glad I didn't bet you a pizza on it, but um, I expect within 20, 25 days, you'll see an indictment roll out. I think you have to wait till the 22nd to see if the um, the circuit court is going to dismiss the master on the Mar-a-Lago case. And if they dismiss the master, I, I think you'll see one shortly thereafter. Uh, but, you know, your question is what happens if he is indicted? And, you know, Donald Trump's 
uh, announcement that he was running for the 2024 um, presidency, uh, he said multiple times, I'm a victim. Wait till he gets an indictment. Then he's going to be uh, <laughs> the victim with the exponential powers of victimhood. Yeah, well, that's true. It's you know, all the victimhood points are connectable. Is the, look, look, they're they're making me even more of a victim. You, Anything you, you, that happens to Donald Trump, he's going to say it's a witch hunt. I'm a victim, and you could be a victim too. Yeah, uh, he's oh. trying to basically incorporate their their support into his his uh, emotions of victimhood, well, and your, they have enough grievances on their own. They have enough grievances on their own that they can translate those grievances into Donald Trump's victimhood. You think it'll work then? <laughs> it does work. It has it has worked. Um, but remember, there's other factors other than you know his base, and I, I think a big factor is money. Uh, look at Blackstone; they're pulling out. Major Republican donors are pulling out now. Donald Trump may have a, a war chest of a hundred million dollars. That's a that's nothing to sneeze at, but. When you start getting the media to pull out uh, covering for his coverage, you get the dollars starting to pull away. Um, this is a serious iceberg to his Titanic. And um, watch out. He, he may not get the funding that he thinks he's going to get. And um, all the victimhood in the world is not going to change that. Mickey, um, you know, what about the base? Because the base, you know, in the absence of evidence of the contrary, although his big funders may be pulling out, although the you know, the people in liberal cities, people like us, uh, you know, you know, are, are, are not affected, not is certainly not impressed by what he's doing. But the but the base may still be loyal to him. And, uh, you know, when he threw his hat in a ring, I imagine he got a lot of new contributions uh, over that. And if, if it had no other purpose, it was to raise money. So um, what do you think about the base and the money and their loyalty to him? You know, I think the only way to counter a surge in uh, Trumpania, you know, is really for the Republicans to find one or two other candidates to rally around and for them internally for that uh, dedicated base to come to their senses and say, well, we have very differing views from the Democrats. Certainly, we don't need to rally around a lunatic you know, uh, who wants to be a dictator. Uh, I think that if they can do that, that is probably the better hope uh, really for the Democrats to have some kind of balanced conversation. But the other thing I would say is I think a lot of this is going to hinge on where the economy is, how we manage inflation. Uh, I think when people are satisfied and happy, there's a lot less anger, which is what Trump is fueling, you know, off of, right? The border, they're taking our jobs. We just had this conversation with some folks the other night. Nobody's taking any jobs. Without Hispanics, Filipinos, the immigrants in our country, the economy would come to a standstill. You couldn't function. There'd be no restaurants, no hotel cleaners, you know, but he's fueling off this because he knows it resonates with people who are not happy with their situation. So I think a lot of it also depends on how our economy is. You know, we were very impressed, Stephanie, with the fact that uh, Fox News, um, you know, has pulled their, you know, uh, support for him. Uh, that's the understatement of it. Um, and, you know, and maybe other media will follow. And uh, certainly MSNBC and CNN are going to keep on uh, pointing out uh, how off the wall he is. But, but, the problem I, I started with is uh, he's he's the guy. He's the Bonnie and Clyde. He's the anti-hero for the American people. Nobody um, nobody presents in the same way. Uh, how can the media actually, if they want to, slow him down? Well, I, I don't think um, they're going to be. Uh in control necessarily because the as i understand uh, the commentary on prospects uh for congressional people to do their work it's going to uh, it's going to be about investigations and again this this goes into tim's point about the victimization so depending on how it is that the the republicans are going to spend their time 
in the House and how successful they're going to be with with those investigations and getting back at all of these ridiculous um, considerations and controversies and their conspiracy theories. Um, they're being they're being encouraged to not go that route. But nevertheless, I was very uh, encouraged that the White House, Biden, they've been preparing for this eventuality, which they thought was going to happen. So they're ready to go to 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 fight back on, on this. I don't like using fight because I think that really they're trying to do everything to get into position, to take advantage of any opportunity they're going to have with the Republicans to be bipartisan. But they they know the reality of it is they're going to have to get through this Jim Jordan stuff and uh, if McCarthy is going to be able to control any of it. So, again, going back to the point of the vi- victimization, um, then he's got all of that agenda to work with. And that is going to draw the base and that's going to feed the base and they may not be able to get past that. So, quite frankly, over the next year, I think it's likely we're, we're going to see a lot of him. We're going to hear a lot of him. We're going to have the base lit up. Uh, with, but but I think other factors will occur. As Vicky says, we're going to have an economic yeah. situation improved, et cetera. So the multifactorial here and it might get better, but it could stay bad for a long time. Okay, but so he's, here, here we are, Tom, uh, Tim. And um, uh, we have we have to recognize that, um, as Stephanie does, that this is dynamic. Uh, yes. That what we have today is, you know, and this has been the case from our first coverage of Trump, uh, is it changes and all kinds of new factors move in. Uh, factors pro, factors con. It's part of the this um, this uh, apprentice show. Um, you never know what's going to happen from day to day. It's, it's like reality, isn't it? I'm wondering if you could help us understand what factors, what changes coming forward, going forward, would help him and would hurt him. I mean, for example, you know, we teeter totter on what's going on in Ukraine uh, with Putin. We teeter totter on the economy. Uh, we teeter totter on the southern border right now. Um, gee, there's so many things that that could change dramatically. I mean, to the point of, you know, taking the headlines. Um, I, I might add that the New York Times um, yesterday uh, had a, an editorial board article, the likes of which I have never seen before. They mm. really let him have it. Um, they, they, it was a long article. It probably occupied in the print, in the print version the whole left-hand column on the editorial page. And it was it no holds barred. Uh, he's incompetent and he is not worthy. Um, that's that was the principle of it. And if the press does that, uh, maybe maybe that's another element, you know, in all of this mix. But I want to know from you what what events, what dynamics could change this uh, this recipe going forward. Tough question. Um, factors. Well, we've already talked about some of the factors, and that is one: money, campaign donation monies from the big the big the big funders. Uh, number two is media coverage. Number three, though, is the candidates themselves. We may see a spoiler candidate. We may see a Liz Cheney break out and say, for the good of the country, I'm going to run as an independent. And she could pull the reasonable GOP out away from Trump should he be the nominee. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, you know, Jay, remember a year ago, we were fantasizing, if you will, if you want to use that word, fantasizing about a candidate who has standing. And that candidate in standing would say, uh, Donald Trump should be removed from the field under the artic- uh, Article 14 of the, uh, the Constitution, Paragraph 3. And an indictment would go a long way into proving to a court that that candidate in standing, no matter who it may be, has a good point. So there's so many factors that are unknown. Um, but I think just a quality candidate to distract away from the tired, worn out Trump fatigue issue that we're all experience. Uh, and and even the GOP base, I think, are getting tired of them, some of them. And or we're waiting for a quality candidate, but it's way too early. I mean, if Ron DeSantis were to say, sure, I'm going to run, he just got elected governor. That would really hurt him that he was, you know, uh, his his run for being governor of Florida was all a sham because he never really wanted to be a, a governor of, of Florida for a second term. So he can't put his hat in the ring for at least, I say, at least seven or eight months. Um, so we're going to be looking at other candidates. Who knows? Yeah. 
You know, what Ricky, do you think of Mike Pence? Do you think he's going to run? Oh, of course. He, he said so, if not explicitly, <laughs> certainly implicitly, <laughs> with his interview. <laughs> Mike Pence um, will be a nice, calm, kind of like Joe Biden, a nice, soothing effect on the Republicans. Saying, oh, yeah, I remember what it was kind of like to be normal as a party. And Mike Pence would re represent that. Um, when he throws his hat in the ring, uh, Vicky, that's a great question. Vicky, who else do you think might, um, you know, emerge here and, uh, and be the, uh, the person who, who could, I don't want to say challenge, but I will say challenge Trump, at least for the headlines? You know, I think that uh, the Republicans uh, who so want to win, you know, in two years are going to look at it differently from the last election. And I think that they recognize Donald Trump. Uh, hopefully they're not going to be the base supporting him. And with that said, I think they may rally around one other candidate and go all in to support them. I uh, I don't think it will be a Liz Cheney. I think it's going to be more like a, a Pence or a DeSantis, both of, of whom will invoke the uh, religious issues and self-anointed, you know, that it's providence. I'm anointed by God to be the next president <laughs> and energize that religious base to really get behind them. That That's just my own feeling that that is something that could happen. Mm. You know, Stephanie, it's entirely possible that uh, with Trump's hamburger diet, um, he, he may not have <laughs> the health to last through 2024 or thereafter. And I just wonder what you think will happen in the country. That's going to create a, you know, if it happened right now, um, it would create a big vacuum. Uh, we'll call it a political, social, beyond all those things, uh, a vacuum in the country, in the news, in, in our public attention. Um, but what, what would happen if Trump disappeared off the stage uh, right now or in six months or in a year? What would happen to the country? Where are we? Uh, what would we be doing, missing, um, yearning for, uh, would we survive as a democracy? <laughs> I think it would be a welcome situation to, to a large degree, because recall that there are many secret Republicans and others that just can't take it either. And they're, they're as negative towards him as, uh, as Democrats uh, uh, and liberals are. But I, I think it would be fine. We move on, right? We have done JFK and we have done, we've lost a lot of people and we keep on going. And there's always someone competent to pick it up if we can um, manage it. I don't know that that's DeSantis, given his extreme stance on freedoms and how many he's taken away. And uh, I'm just appalled at these people that are, are getting so much acclaim um, and winning elections when they've done nothing to help their people. And in particular, Ron DeSantis. I mean, he even went after the mouse for crying out loud. I mean, I'd, how can anybody forget that? So um, I'm just, uh, yeah, I think, yes, it, it raises uh, an, a question about what's going to happen, but it won't be but a heartbeat before uh, the next person is going going to step up. We'll find out who that is. I, I don't know that Pence is lighting any fires and uh, he's just not going out much for the Constitution or the country. He's all about selling his book. So we've got some uh, players there. It's just like the person that's going to be perhaps the next uh, House uh, uh, leader. So I'm, there's somebody that's been running under the radar. May, maybe to me, he's been under the radar. Maybe you all know about him. But uh, so there's somebody out there that can do this. And uh, I think the Democrats have some fabulous possibilities to draw on. And we'll mention the California governor. He's doing quite well and I think would be eager to support America in some dire circumstance like that or on his own volition. So that that's uh, what. I'm thinking uh, American is resilient and uh, we come back and uh, we're get, going to get over Trump and the sooner the better. And I think everybody's ready. It's interesting so, you put it that way. You know, America, America needs to come back. And yeah. Trump at the same time is trying to come People back. Are where, where are we that we have to come back? Everybody has to come back. Well, is that, he, is there... 
Why don't we just he, go he, forward? He reinserted, <laughs> he reinserted himself. I mean, he was supposed to be gone two years ago. So he mm. reinserted himself uh, in the whole thing, and he's going to continue to do that. And we're going to have to endure it until he runs out of steam or hamburgers get him or some other issues come up and, or he chooses to pr- proceed. Well, it's, worth, it's worth watching, although I, I hate to use his name. It's, it, we have to watch it. <laughs> All the media has to watch it. Yes. But, you know, Tim, I wanted to ask you probably the most difficult question of the day, and that's this. In terms of the dynamic, um, you know, we have been following Trump since pretty much the beginning of his term in 2017. Um, and, you know, we've called the show by various names and we've tried to connect the dots on it. And, we, and we've seen the country change. Okay, We've seen all his machinations, uh, the, the machinations, the people around him, uh, who, you know, who, who emerged as his uh, loyal and faithful. Um, we've seen the base change, if we were watching, um, and and we've seen the democracy change. Um, and, and the people who were, say, 12 years old at the time you and I started to do this um, are now voting. They didn't know anything, you know, when they were 12 most of them. Um, now, presumably, they're, you know, they're entrusted with the vote. Um, so my question to you, Tim, is how has our country changed since you and I started talking about this? How has our democracy, our view of the rule of law, our view of government, our view of government officials, how has the country's view changed? And how has the view of those Formerly twelve-year-olds, how have how 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 has their view changed? Well, Joe, you know you're right. We've been doing these shows for over five years. Uh, Trump Week uh, that was a long-running title for our show. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to think those twelve-year-olds were watching our show and they're savvy voters. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm but sure uh, to, to, to answer your question, um, I think. Democracy actually has sprung forward. Look how many people are engaged in the voting process. Like we are seeing numbers like never before across the country. This is a good thing. Uh, even if they vote for Donald Trump, we have engaged voters. And before we had a lot of apathy. And, and you know, I hate to say it, but Hawaii is probably the number one state for uh, vo- low voter turnout. But my God, look at how many people are engaged with politics and the topic of the day. So I think this is a good thing for democracy. Um, I think also people realize how fragile democracy is. And it doesn't take much to really uh, weaken its foundations. And they've seen the, uh, I, you like to use that word machinations, and that's a great word. The machinations of Donald Trump to uh, basically chisel and, and detract from those foundations of democracy. And it's not that difficult. And so I think that's a real learning lesson for a lot of Americans. And I think the midterm elections prove that. I think people were concerned about uh, what direction election deniers were taking our politics and how they fall in lockstep with Donald Trump. And I think they said, I'm going to vote differently. I'm not going with the flow. So Donald Trump and his influence lost the independents and lost moderate Republicans. That's what the difference was in this midterm election. Uh, So I think many positive things have come forward in the last five years. I also think that on the negative side, that uh, Americans have become desensitized to outrageous words and behavior. And Donald Trump still has that, what I would call a hypnotic influence upon voters, basically to follow his words to the nth degree. And Donald Trump, as uh, uh, former Governor John Wyhey said, Donald Trump has given permission to a certain population to follow and like and replicate his poor words and actions. So those are the negative things that I think we've seen in the last five years. But I'm hopeful. I, I'm really I'm really energized and, and very positive that Fox Media is pulling away. Donors are pulling away. And I, I think these are positive signs. So uh, more 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 hope for the future. Vicky, I have a question. This- is just as challenging for you, <laughs> you know, how, how has this whole Trump experience, and you've been at the point of it as a, as a candidate for governor, 
Uh, how has this Trump experience uh, affected uh, Hawaii, the voters in Hawaii, and the legislature in Hawaii, the government in general in Hawaii? And we are now at another, you know, one of our many inflection points. Um, how do the midterms affect our voters and our government in Hawaii? Uh, are we, i put it this way, are we closer um, to what's going on in the mainland now than we were a few years ago? And will we be closer still? Well, I think there's no question that Hawaii is different from it from a decade ago. And I, I do think that's why I, I like this show, because what happens on the mainland does impact Hawaii. And you can't deny that. And sometimes just because of our location, people here think, oh, that's the, you know, the mainland. This is Hawaii. But it does. We're all connected together. One of the things for me as an immigrant, Asian, that was very concerning with Donald Trump is there's no question that that he fueled a lot of the anti-Asian, you know, the hate feeling, blamed COVID on China, you know, and, and that definitely has created more of that anger in our country. And I think you're seeing some of that here uh, in Hawaii, although, of course, we're strongly democratic, uh, but there is there is more polarization than there was 10 years ago. It's not a bad thing to have differing opinions. I think that's important to have differing views. But how we come together to work through that for the good of the majority of the people that is what's at stake. And I, I hope that with Trump setting aside that uh, we can have more balance in this country and uh, that the 2024 elections will bode well as the midterm has overall been, I think, for Democrats. It partly relates to the, uh, the conversation I just had with Tim, um, that one, one thing you can't deny, none of us can deny, is that there's been more hate. We have grown to have more divisiveness and more hate, and we still have it. Uh, so let me go back to Tim and say, let's assume that. Let's assume that my perception of it is right, that we do have more, you know, per Vicky's thought, we do have more hate, more bigotry going on in the country. And, and it happened during Trump's watch. And, and in my view, it's because of Trump. He Just as he incited that uh, January 16th insurrection, he also incited the hate. Um, how does the country recover from that? Because it could be that we have, we have found our own devil here, um, that we have found this kind of satanic thing in our culture. How do you put the genie, the, the satanic culture back in the bottle? Um, you know what, Jay? I, was, I can't believe you brought that up because I was thinking of making that point. So um, can I just jump in here and then go to Tim? Because I wanted to make the point that what we have from Trump is his base. And he has incited or resurrected or res brought up a base of people into a power structure that we have not been very cognizant of before. That is not going to change because those people are not going to give up their power. So it's how is it that those people are going to be managed, are going to be influenced, are going to be led. That is going to make for um, our devilment in the future or our way of somehow moving forward. So, Tim, I, I just had that already was in my head. I yeah, no, I think you're spot on. I think you're spot on. And again, I think Donald Trump brought out the underbelly of what's been in America for hundreds of years, and that is yes. um, our inner racist feelings. Mm -hmm. And until the last 10 years, um, I think there's been a white male fear factor that's been unspoken. And Donald Trump, for lack of a better term, has released those demons. And until we can assure Americans, especially white male Americans, that no, your role in society is not being pushed in the back of the room. You're an equal player, just like everybody else. But um, right now, kind of like um, Vicky's comment about uh, immigration and how the immigrants are gonna take away your jobs. Well, that's a false flag, that's not true. Just like um, the, the stoking of white male fear, it's not true. Replacement theory, it's not true. So until we get a leader that can coalesce all parties and we need it. I think it comes down to a leader that can that mm -hmm. can is charismatic, can communicate effectively and is seen as a bipartisan leader for all of America. 
I, I don't think we get to that point in which you've suggested, Jay. I think we continue to struggle along. I think it comes up to a leader that it, is not a polarizing uh, leader who, who, who tries to separate and divide Americans. It's a leader that tries to bring them all together, yet at the same time has the support and following of both uh, independents, Republicans, and Democrats. Yeah, amen to that. Okay, we're time, we're time uh, for final comments. Uh, Vicki, can you go first? Uh, one thing we haven't covered is the dynamics in Congress right now, you know, with the result of the midterms. Um, and you might discuss that. I leave it to you. But uh, can you give us your final thoughts today? Yeah, I, I'm encouraged by the midterm elections. I think what it said was that no, no one party can can take that role of dominating the country. We need to work together. And uh, I think it also showed that for the Republican base, uh, Donald Trump may not necessarily be the one in 2024. So I think all around uh, it's encouraging. I hope that we can move forward and media and uh, should give equal time to other candidates so that the public can get to know others and not just keep hearing the name because sometimes that in itself encourages people just to vote for them because of familiarity even if it's a bad one <laughs> yeah. so i'm encouraged and thank you all for having me today <laughs> stephanie what are your final comments you'd like to leave with our audience i would like to leave uh, my comment about my concern that uh, Hawaii turnout in our election was uh, 41%. I was utterly astounded at that. And I think that uh, as all the things Vicki has said and, and, and Tim too, um, we have got to be actively involved in our democracy and whatever we can do um, to encourage uh, that higher rate. And I, it was higher across the nation. I don't actually have the figures, but it wasn't higher than the last election, but it was high. So uh, we Hawaii's behind the, um, behind on this. And I, I, I think we need to address that and, and remind our leaders to get, let, let's get excited about it and get out there and, and do our special thing, which is to vote. Yeah, the mainland could learn a lot from us, on, honestly. Except in turnout. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we had that. Oh, no. Republicans are getting pretty active here. So the Republicans are getting active. And like yeah, Vicky said, to have more than one opinion, of course, we want that. But we still want to make sure we're managing our, our portion of the conversation and the, and the activity. Definitely. So let's go, Hawaii. Get out and vote, for crying out loud. <laughs> okay. So, Tim, uh, you know, your turn, but uh, maybe you could, among other things, address the notion uh, that one of these days, um, and it's wishful thinking, that Trump is off the radar and off the headlines. And uh, what, what are we going to do here on Think Tech? What are we going to do for news and comment? Will we talk about flowers, rainbows, and unicorns. <laughs> Let's go with the unicorns. <laughs> More happy things, Jay. I'm burned out, man. It's been five years. Aloha. It's aloha time. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about why we live here. <laughs> How about okay. a white time? <laughs> I um I may share, I may hold the minority opinion here from all the experts, but um, if you remember the title of my show yesterday was Trump is no longer kingmaker. And if I were to put a subtitle to that title, it would be Trump is toast, not all the orange marmalade is gonna help him. <laughs> so um, look, I'd like to think that as the indictments come down the path, as money rolls away from him, as media attention rolls away from him, Donald Trump will continue to spark off like a, a disgruntled nine-year-old bully on the playground, but he diminishes over time, he starts to fade. And God, that would be the most wonderful thing. And if it takes a Mike Pence to do that, because he's a calming uh, sort of personality, fine. Let's let's bring on Mike Pence. <laughs> or a Democrat, if you don't mind. If you don't mind. Yeah. So um, you know, I <laughs> suppose you, know, you go home today and some 12-year-old kid uh, says to you, uh, Tim, uh, what did you guys talk about on American Issues Take Two today? And your answer is, well, among other things, we, we talked about orange marmalade. That's right. And stay tuned, little kitties, because in five years, you're going to be voting. 
<laughs> you bet. <laughs> yes, we're going to get them out next time. And Vicky, that's another issue with the, the whole turnout. Who won? I'm just so shocked at that this time. Yeah. So we All right, Tim. Tim Apicello, uh, Vicky Caetano, Stephanie Stoll-Dalton. Thank you so much for joining us today. Great discussion. Aloha. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.